Welcome back to Notes for Engineers. I'm Alistair Cook, and I'm joined by another of my friends, Mr. Stu Fox. Would you like to tell everybody who you are and where you come from? G'day, well, my name's Stu Fox. Uh, I work for a company called Datacom in New Zealand. Uh, I do what's called, I'm a senior solutions advisor, so I help customers figure out cloud architectures and those kinds of things. Cool, and what are you going to talk to uh, our wonderful audience about today? So today I thought I'd talk about Azure Pack and give you an overview of how Azure Pack works and you know how it fits together. And cool. So yeah, so I thought I'd start with that. Excellent. Well, cool. we'll dive straight in. Cool. All right. So I guess we start with philosophy because mm -hmm. you know back in the day Socrates and uh, such. Right. But the philosophy of Azure Pack is about bringing an Azure-like experience on-premises, and I guess for hosters as well. So it's basically Microsoft saying, you know, we want a, a single experience, whether you're on-premises, whether you're at a hosting provider, or whether you're in cloud with the real Azure. So what Azure Pack does is it brings kind of a subset of, and, and I say subset, it's quite a small subset, of the Azure features down to, um, down to your on-premises stuff. So um, it, it's, it's built up a bunch of things, and it gets kind of complicated, so we might need two of these posted. That's quite all right. We can tear right. off the top one and throw it away. Look at that. Um, so we start off with what I call um, the Azure Pack Core. So let's call it Core. And the Core is made up of a bunch of bits. So the first thing is some portals. And there's basically two portals. There's a tenant portal and an administrator portal. So um, tenant portal, think of I'm a customer coming in or an end user coming in, logging in, want to spin up a resource, um, I come in and log onto the tenant portal. And the great thing about the tenant portal is that it's basically exactly the same experience as when you log into the real Azure portal. So it's a consistent look and feel. Um, you know, if I want to spin up a VM, I go and spin up a VM exactly as I would with with real Azure. So, so it's, it's all just cool. a different URL in, in the UR? It, pretty much. It's your own private URL um, and away you go. It's great. There's also an admin portal and this is kind of different because in real Azure you don't get an admin portal, you don't get to see anything what's going on behind the scenes. So, But the admin portal is how as administrators we define what resources we're going to make available to to our end users, um, define things like service plans, so how are they going to consume those resources, uh, what limits we're going to place on them, what things they can and can't do. And Plus, this, this is what the IT team within the organization would do for on-premises or if it was for a, a private Cloud deployment, yeah, right. so public cloud deployment, it would be the, the service providers. Absolutely, yep. So, so that's yep. So that's your kind of administrative view. The next bit is APIs, and you know, Azure being Azure and and those kinds of things, and it, it being a cloud type experience, it is kind of API driven as mm. well. So if you want to script against it, well, great, you can you can do that if you want to. And once again, actually, there's two there's two APIs. We've got an admin API and a tenant API, and so you can do different things. So as a tenant, I can come in and basically, you know, spin up resources, those kinds of things through the tenant API. Microsoft provide a set of PowerShell commands that you can run against the, the Azure Pack API, and then we've got the admin API, which lets you kind of, you know, drive the admin portal via the API. So, um, you know, all, all about being command line driven. And kind of... The, and that API is also going to allow somebody like the... the um, the service provider to integrate this into their own provisioning portal for their customers. So yeah. it's got to have multiple services that they're consuming, and that that will be an integration point. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah, so so your your service provider can just yeah, skin across the top. And actually, there's a there are a couple of service providers that do this, and um, even Parallels, who provide you know pretty popular hosting portal, have written a, a whole set of skins across the top of this as well. So you can integrate Parallels and have a consistent Parallels experience across the top of Azure Pack. Uh, the last bit is uh, something I've completely forgotten. Let me refresh you on Here's one I prefer to do. Ah, yes. Authentication. Authentication. So, authentication. So, once again, guess what? There's two bits of authentication. There's tenant and admin authentication. So, by default, admin authentication uses um, basically Windows. Um, and, and by default, tenant uses what's called the .NET 
authentication provider. Um, both of those things can be replaced, so you can switch those out for ADFS. So if you want to, if you if you're running this kind of as a as a private cloud deployment, well, actually, you really want users logging in with their AD credentials. Both of them back yeah. up to the and same. Same with the admin, admin. You want to just point that at your at your ADFS, yeah. and away you go. You log in with your domain credentials. But for a service provider, you do absolutely who knows what for your internal, but tenants but so allowed tenants, to have their own ADFS, and they can come in and sign up and do all that stuff themselves. So you know, and it is, but it is your choice about what you do there. But by default, it ships with Windows Auth for admin and the .NET Auth, which is basically an inbuilt um, authentication provider. And of course, we don't get anywhere doing anything without a database. Everything's driven by Everything databases. Is, you've got to have a database. So uh, there is a SQL database in the back end, which, which holds configuration, and if you're using the .NET authentication, things like users and those kinds of things. So that's all held in a central configuration store. And so that's what we that's what I kind of call the Azure Pack core. I don't know if Microsoft call it that, but that's what I call it. And and that kind of is is provides kind of yeah, your your UI to getting into getting into this thing, um, an API for driving it and how we authenticate. So that's kind of the first bit. So what we'll do is we'll switch to a new bit of paper. So once you've built up that core, and, and the great thing about the core is you can distribute the core, and it can be run on a single machine, so what they call an express install. Just um, you get it from the web platform installer, download it, just to do a single machine install, and away it goes. You can run the whole set of it on a single machine. Really um, suitable to proof out that this absolutely. is a good concept to use, yeah. quick and easy deploy, but not really fit for a large scale production. Yeah, deployment. for a large scale deployment, not great, but for a small scale deployment, you can you can actually use uh, an express deployment. Um, you would want to separate out the SQL database. That would be the only thing. But being based in New Zealand, lots of things are small scale deployments. Yeah, absolutely. everything's a small scale deployment, effectively. Um, but you can distribute out everything basically after you've done that. So you can say you know you could run everything on separate machines. So you could end up with this distributed deployment that's you know got six seven VMs running the whole mm. running just the the, the Azure the infrastructure. Core. For the, for sure. Yeah, which you know for like say for most New Zealand customers that's probably going to be overkill. For a service provider, you might do things like separate out the tenant facing bits, so mm. the public facing bits. So it would be the tenant portal and the tenant API. You would separate those out and have those facing on a public VM, and then have your All all of private the admin, admin stuff sitting inside. Yeah, and you'd internal. need to scale the tenant facing stuff fairly large for a large provider. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and again, you know, if you wanted to scale, you would say tenant. API and tenant auth and tenant um, portal on portal. separate boxes if you wanted to, and so you, and you can do things like load balance all these things. They're all built. Mm. It's all built, built to, do to scale. That. Yeah. So once you've got all that stuff up and running, the next thing you do is basically add services. And so there's a bunch of services, and like I said, you know this provides a subset of what you're going to do in in, in, full in full azure. So. Um, I guess the, the first thing, and, and you know, the thing that is probably dear to all our hearts, is VMs, uh, infrastructure as a service style stuff. So, an infrastructure as a service actually comes in kind of two flavors: um, traditional VMs. So, hey, you know, I want to run up a VM. Um, away go, but um, you know it's Windows and Linux. Give so me I can a run template it up. of a VM. Yeah, and, and away you go. For yep, yeah. and and it is traditional kind of Azure Pack. Uh, oh, sorry, Azure um, T-shirt size VM. So you know, small, medium, large, mm -hmm. rather than the the rather than the defining. Can't menu. Yeah, I want, yeah, I want, I want some of three this three processors and seventy two gigs of RAM or whatever crazy oh, combination you want. On this one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You 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 get kind of limited to what the service provider or, or your you know your admins are you going to find for you. Have it any size you want, so long as it's in the, it's it, in the catalog. So long as it's black. That's right. Um, and the other bit that you get is this thing called VM roles, and and VM roles are more like a cloud PaaS deployment, I suppose. So you would say, I want a VM role which is, hey, it might be a Linux box with a LAMP stack built on it. So, and that's pre-built, and I just push that out, and and I get one of those. But the great thing about a VM role is I can scale that. So I can say, give me a second one of those, and so I just push out another one from the same template. Bang, away it goes. So the big difference here is there's an application set inside the virtual machine. Exactly, that and it's deploying. custom, and, and you can define and customize that. Microsoft push out a whole bunch of um, role definition stuff that you can import in and, and do stuff. So they've got stuff, yeah, like I say, they've got SQL, stuff for IAS, SQL, IIS, Exchange, I don't, yeah, um, Link. They've got a bunch of ones you can push down and and um, and just push out. 
So it, it's, it's quite a different way of thinking about things. It's more a service orientated mm. way of doing it. Um, and obviously in the back end of this, um, we have a couple of key components, um, virtual machine manager and a bit of software called service provider foundation, which is part of system center orchestrator. And under that sits Hyper-V. At the moment, it's, um, it, you know, even though VMM supports talking to vSphere, it is a Hyper-V only solution. I, I understand there's a partner solution which actually plugs in this and, and enables vSphere, but um, you know, the, the native Microsoft but stack the whole, is... The whole plan for Azure is Hyper-V based. It's Hyper-V, yep, so it's all Hyper-V. I guess the other bit I didn't talk about there is um, the virtual networking. So using the Hyper-V network virtualization stack, you can in the infrastructure as a service component, define your own virtual networking and, and define your own IP ranges and those kinds of things, and then map that out through um, the network virtualization, gate, virtualization gateways and map those out through to um, a customer network. So if you're a service provider, they could have you know, a VPN, VPN through, 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 yeah, through to their own sure. private network here, which is, you know, that's pretty clever. Or presumably a contracted tail as well. Yeah, so it's all, it's all um, very clever stuff. Mm. Um, so that's kind of how that bit works. I guess the next bit is um, websites. And this is kind of uh, very similar to the, the Azure websites feature. And so what it does is it allows you to create uh, scalable cloud-style websites that you can um, you know, scale up, scale down really quickly um, based on set of Windows machines running in the background, running iOS 8, um, and that gives the ability to um, self-service provision, so, so you get to um, FTP or um, use Visual Studio, um, and you can push content up to your um, Visual Studio, yeah. and push content up to your website, um, or uh, I think Web Matrix even. Um, and it also integrates with a bunch of source control systems. So I can I say I, I can push from I can push from Dropbox. I can push from um, GitHub. I can push from a bunch of different places. Or if you're um, managing your versioning. Yeah, yeah. So I can so I can push content up to, to websites, which is um, that's quite an unusual noise, isn't it? It is. I believe it's the uh, the room alarm clock. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> Where was I? Pushing content up from your ah, pushing uh, content source up from control. Website. Yeah, so, so um, the other thing it gives you is, is the ability to scale. So I can say, hey, I want to run 10 instances of this website, or I want to run two instances, and so it gives the ability to, to scale um, based on, on user demand. And this is without going into the VM roles, which would be the other way to, Ab to slice this functionality. Absolutely, yeah. So, so this is basically, this is more like a PaaS. Um, mm. it's, mm. it's, you know... It's not quite a PaaS, but it's more like one. And so, and I can run .NET, I can run PHP, I can run Node, I can run all sorts of different platforms on this thing. So I'm yeah. not limited to, to you know, just .NET it's, and it's IIS. Just not .NET yeah. and IIS. It, is, it is a bunch of different um, stacks there. And so that website's features, you know, it, it enables you to build kind of web scale um, websites um, without kind of having to Without having to build go, all of the websites exactly yeah so it's it's a it's it's quite a cool little feature as well the other couple of features um, I kind of you kind of lump this in and call it database mm -hmm. um, and so we've got SQL and MySQL so we you know as an end user I can come and say I want a SQL database spin me up and it'll create me a SQL database, you know, give it a username and a logon, and that SQL database will be available for me. Same with MySQL. With SQL, you know, you can provide um, SQL always on available databases in there, so you can provide high availability to your customers as well, and you can just um, make that available out, um, th again, through the service, again, through, a service the, through the portal. Yeah. Off the catalog. And, and generally, you know, you would you would be leveraging that SQL, SQL or MySQL database through the websites feature, or maybe through you know infrastructure as a service if you're running apps. There. Yeah, so there may well be a, a customer facing website that's backed by this database, and then there'll be a job processing going on, and order processing going on, and this this back end. I absolutely. IAS. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And so, and and. You know, I as a as a consumer of the service, all I care about is that my database is created exactly. somewhere and running. I don't really want to manage a whole SQL server or any other stuff that goes on with that. So it's all protected it's all and backed up, and I can. There's a little tick, tick box to say I want high availability through always and on. And you those you kinds basically of define define things like always on through your service plan. Say, yeah. hey, this is the, this is the high availability service plan. This is the kind of the standard tier service plan. And if I subscribe to that high availability, then you know, whatever it's created in an always on availability group, it's 
you know, so so it deals with kind of the, the provisioning back end. There's a couple of other bits. Uh, one of them is service bus, service bus, and service bus is basically a message queuing um, type application. It, it's a it's a Microsoft service, and so that basically allows you to, to do kind of message queuing stuff. Push things through to uh, a synchronous processing yeah. somewhere in the background. Yep. So, and that could be leverage, hey, by your website's here, mm. going through and it may some be what processor drives here. drives out of the database into the message bus back to the processing yep. machine. Absolutely. Um, and so that's just another nice. service that plugs in. And the last one is kind of an interesting service. And, and the reason I've left it till last is because it's not really a user-facing service. It's plugged in as a service, but it's actually an administrative back-end service, and it's a feature called SMA, Service Management Automation. And so what this is, is effectively a PowerShell job execution system that allows the administrator to define in the portal a PowerShell-based workflow, which is triggered off by you know some activity or, or run manually, and, and service management automation then allows you to, to run these PowerShell-based workflows to do all all manner of things, you know whatever you can do with PowerShell, and it might be hey when I provision when a new customer is provisioned, all these other things have to happen, or you know, there's provision all... out storage for them, a minimum exactly. set of machines, a collection of users. Exactly, there could be all sorts of things you have to do to, to onboard storage customer. provisioning, those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. so so SMA is kind of it's useful for the admins. It doesn't get exposed to the tenants at all, but it does provide kind of a lot of power to automate the back end environment mm. for you. And the really cool thing about this is that it actually aligns really, really tightly with Azure. Uh, I think they call it Azure Automation. And so it's exactly the same kind of look and feel as Azure Automation, and and it kind of functions and behaves the same way. So if I'm an Azure user, I can you know go up to Azure and go, hey, cool, here's my automation I want to run here. If I'm an administrator of this system, I can run the same automation down here at, at my end, and that's and that's quite a powerful feature. And that um, service management automation is provided through, it's actually a piece of System Center Orchestrator as well. And I think, I think, kind of strategically looking at it, this is kind of where Microsoft is heading with with things like System Center Orchestrator, mm -hmm. going towards more of these PowerShell-based workflows. And I, you know, I think that's kind of what we'll see from them. Wrapping the a, well. a workflow engine around PowerShell, PowerShell. Is, is the well. You know, when you look at it, PowerShell's kind of the API for a whole lot of things now. Mm -hmm. You know, so I can drive, I can drive all the Windows with PowerShell, but I mm -hmm. can drive all sorts of other things. You can I can drive your storage array, your networking store, equipment, I can drive vSphere. Mm -hmm. I can, you know. There's a bunch of people doing some really great things with, with right. PowerShell. Love PowerShell. So, yeah. um, you know, so being able to drive, hey, whatever else I've got out, out there Everything through PowerShell, um, amazing function. Mm. So, yeah. And so that's kind of all the services that, that plug in. Like I say, it is kind of a, you know, a tight oh. subset of what you get in real Azure. Core subset of. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's some things that I think, you know, would be nice. One of the things is, you know, there's, there's not an, uh, an object-based store mm -hmm. in this. And, you know, when you think about building those modern applications, that's one of the things that you know, web developers say, hey, we want an object-based store. Yeah. Um, there isn't one currently, so you kind of got to go elsewhere to, to do that. Um, so I think kind of some of those things would be nice to see in this platform. But you can expect that that would come over time or you could, a tenant could build their own object store again. Out, you, know, you can build anything out of VM, so you could well, build exactly. an object store. Well, well, you know, if you want to be the smartest way hey, to build an object if you store. want to run Ceph or you want to run, mm. you know, the Swift stack or something, then then great, um, do that. And and the the core portal component is extensible. So if you want to add extra services that aren't provided by Microsoft, well, actually you can build that stuff on okay. yourself because the API to do the extension is there as well. Again, this is a platform from which you can build something rather yeah. than something already built. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, and so this is um, the the great thing about Azure Pack. It's just a it's a free component of Windows. So as long as you license for Windows, then it's just it's just a free component. Um, and Microsoft have been releasing updates for Azure Pack as they release updates for System Center and Windows through their quarterly update cycle. So you get kind of a couple of new features here and there, bug fixes, those kinds of things, as they release their quarterly um, update releases. And are they releasing sort of feature chase against Azure for, for here they, as well? They haven't seen to me so far. It's, it's been kind of pretty static. Um, so it's been stability, reliability, yeah. and, and performance. There's, you know, when you think about some things that, Azure's kind of this public cloud thing, so they don't worry so much about enterprise-style functionality. Mm. One of the things you have kind of seen with the Azure Pack releases is they've kind of gone for some enterprise functionality. They've recognized so, this is going to be on, on premises yeah. at large enterprise yeah, organizations. Yeah, so, so you see things like the websites feature uh, got 
the ability to do AD authentication and the ability to muck around with a couple of other bits and pieces inside websites, which is useful for enterprises, but you know you but just don't care about it. Yeah. yeah, so you know there those are the kinds of things they seem to be driving it, driving enterprise style functionality into what they do here. Okay. So that's all I've got to talk about. Excellent. So, well, thanks, thanks, um, Stu. Uh, where can people find you online? Uh, online, I've got a Twitter account, which is usually pretty noisy, and uh, I'm just Stu Fox, S-T-U-F-O-X. Um, if you don't mind swearing, then then follow me. Um, and on my blog, I've got stufox.wordpress.com, um, and I've been doing a bit of blogging about the Azure Websites feature lately. So, you know, if you want to know detail about that, then that's where you go. Excellent, and hopefully, I'll be able to convince Stu to come and do some more videos with us over time. Should be able to. That hasn't been too negative an experience the first time. <laughs> uh, this has been Notes for Engineers. I'm Alistair Cook, and you can find us at notesforengineers.com.